Welcome to the Millennial Method Podcast, where I dive into the personal stories of millennials that have chased their dreams, overcome challenges, and redefined success in this pivotal era. I'm your host, Marky, and my guest for today is Johnny Tran. You might have seen him on TikTok, Instagram, doing these dance transitions where he changes into different clothes, and it's like super smooth. And um, he's a good friend of mine. He recently has gone creator full time. And we dive into that. We talk about the creator life, what it's actually like to become an influencer, that word influencer. Um, I tried I tried not to use that word while we were talking. I, I prefer content creator because influencer has a lot of different connotations. And we talk about that. You know, we talk about what were what are the uh, misconceptions of being an influencer. And we talk about living in LA, how that has impacted his career. We talk about the origin story. You know, he, he didn't expect to become a content creator. Uh, in fact, he wanted to become a dance teacher. And so we talk about that. And it was a great conversation and one that a lot of people can relate to because, you know, some people are just love to entertain. And we have this new platform in TikTok where you can entertain in 30 seconds to a minute, um, short form videos and kind of like the business of it. And yeah, we just talk all things uh, being a creator on social media. And so I hope you enjoyed this episode. And without further ado, here is Johnny Tran. Johnny, what's up, my Yo. brother? <laughs> what's good? How you doing? Been doing good. Had a had a productive day. I'm feeling good. I'm excited to get to chat with you, man. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, man, I feel like I don't even remember the last time we've talked. Probably David's wedding. <laughs> yeah yeah sounds it's been a while it's been a while yeah you're in la now right yes i'm in la um been living here a year lived in irvine for a year before but it's been treating me well it's been a good time yeah and i definitely want to get back into um just you living in la but we have to start with with the transition you know <laughs> your, your 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 claim to fame um, absolutely so i mean I think a lot of people know you for that transition, but can you can you describe to my audience what what that is? Yeah, so I, I do essentially fashion clothing transitions where uh, I'll do like an action, a movement, and I'll completely change clothes. Um, and I guess it it worked out pretty well because they're pretty clean, if I may say so myself. <laughs> and uh, I use a bit of my like dance background to help do a little bit more acrobatic things to make the transitions pop even more. So yeah, it's it's definitely been my claim to fame, the thing that worked out really well for me and people started knowing me really well at really well for. So do you happen to know were you inspired by anything when you were doing that transition? Yeah, actually, so the reason I started doing it was I mean, I saw all the the fashion TikTokers doing it and I really looked up to them. Um, specifically, I saw someone do like a b-boy move and do a transition with that. And, you know, I, I didn't, I've never seen anyone else do that. So I was like, oh, shit, like, I can do that too. But I can do it my own way. And I can do it better, you know. So I picked that up that ended up doing really, really well. And from there, it sort of just sparked something in me where I was like, okay, let me take as many different b-boy moves, breakdance moves, dance moves, and do transitions to them. And like, as I started honing my craft, it got better and better. People knew me for it. And essentially that's, that's how it started. Can you walk me through how, how you set that up? Like, is there, do you have a place where you, you know, you put like some tape or something or like, how do you make it so smooth? Like do you have the secret sauce yeah. for that or can you share that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, at first I used to use, sometimes I'd use like a marker, like a coin or something. Eventually. I realized as long as I do it in roughly the same place, it's going to be fine. So the reason the transitions work out so well is because since they're very dynamic movement, I'm moving through the air really fast for, for something. As long as I do it in the general area, even if it's a few inches off, it'll look really clean just because your eye can't track the movement fast enough to notice when the switch happens. So as long as it's a fast movement, ideally without any static part of you. So if I'm jumping, super easy to do. Um, if it's near the same area, 
then it'll look really, really good. So it's actually not always as crazy as it looks. It's just a little bit of a, a little bit of tricking your mind. It's a bit of an illusion sometimes. And do you remember the first time when these videos started to pop off? Like, do you remember that first video? What was, what was one of the first videos that popped off? I th I, yeah, I do remember. Um, it was one I, I think I did. A, I think it was just a regular kip up, but I just wore like a suit and, you know, combination of, oh, guy in a suit, cool transition. It's just, it's a formula that works. Walk me through Funnily like. Enough. How, how did you feel like what was that feeling like when you first got your what was it like a million views on that or like how did it feel to get that many views <laughs> i imagine that was crazy. yeah definitely in the ballpark of that uh the first time it's definitely a huge dopamine rush i think um it feels very very rewarding and sort of surreal like i don't especially at the time it's not normal to get 1 million views or 2 million, whatever that, like a very big number like that. Um, I mean, it, it just, it just feels great, you know, and for a while it'll feel great. Um, interestingly enough, it does make you a very self-conscious though for the next post. Cause then you start to wonder like, oh shoot, the next one has to be better. Or what if like posting something different or not as good is going to make people not like the other one you know you like you, you get in your head a little bit so it was a mix of euphoria and how good it felt to you know get this vanity metric but also a little bit of um being self-conscious just about the next thing that comes because i think it it feels great to hit once but then from there is like oh what do you do from there you know and i think that's like a big thing for a lot of people. Yeah, we're definitely gonna go back into like social media and you know, be, you becoming a content creator full time. And yeah, um, that's that stuff's like, I think, super important, because I think a lot of people consider, you know, they look at the fame, and they look at the views and stuff. And, um, you know, there's so much into it versus just that, like you said, that vanity metric, right? Right, um, right, right. I want to go back to dance a little bit, because, yeah, um, yeah. you know, I was doing some research as much as I could on the internet. Um, <laughs> I was reading in, you know, one of your interviews that, you know, you wanted to pursue dance, even though you were studying to be, you know, to be a kinesiology major. Mm -hmm. um, you know, during that time, did you, like, did you envision what that looked like, like a dance career while you were, you know, studying kinesiology or like what, what you know, how did that look like to you? I think growing up in the dance community um, shaped what I wanted out of dance. So I looked up to a lot of big choreographers who were either choreographing music. At the time, it was really big on choreographing for artists or or teaching really crazy master classes, getting flown out to teach overseas. Um, I think the art of sharing your craft and, and educating others was really what I looked up to. And that's what I wanted to do. That was the future in dance that I wanted most. And at the time, you know, I, I was a kinesiology major. I graduated with that. I was in school. But part of that was I picked kinesiology because it was related to dance, you know, human movement. Yep. I wanted anything that could relate back to dance so I could, you know, pivot there if needed. Um, but really, the goal was always to try to make a career in dance. But it, it was definitely on the teaching route just because um, those are the people, my inspirations, those are the people I looked up to those were their roles in our community. And that's what I wanted to be as well. Did you think that you would ever come come to this path or you're dancing on, on TikTok and <laughs> that ever crossed your mind? No, I, and I think it's crazy because TikTok grew so fast. Um, and it didn't exist back then when I was very, very heavily dancing. So I literally, I couldn't even thought of or imagine that my career path would change so much. But I think that's the beauty of it, especially being in a creative industry. Like, it's very fickle in that things change, careers change, and what you can do to make it is always very different and will change year to year. So I'm not surprised with taking a very different path, but I just never thought this would happen. Like, this is, it's still surreal that it's possible. Yeah, and I think, uh, I think that's the reason why a lot of us choose a career like a creator path is because we get to 
you know, choose your own path, right? Even uh-huh. the unexpected path. And I think that's, um, I think your story is definitely something that is unexpected <laughs> to just do it, you know, little b- b-boy moves into fashion and <laughs> all of a sudden you're racking all these views and, um, or, you know, working with like K-pop stars and it's just wild to me. And mm. um, I wanted to go back into the fashion stuff because I, I didn't realize you were totally into, fa- I mean, I've known you for a bit. I didn't realize you were totally into fashion. Were you, were you always into, into fashion? Yeah, I was always into fashion. I think it definitely got amplified once I started doing content. But even in middle school, high school, I was all, and college too, I was always experimenting with styles. I think I was just a lot more hesitant to because I didn't have as many role models for fashion who were open to it. So I grew up in high school. I went to a pride, a dominantly white high school. And me dressing up meant people thought, literally they thought I was gay for experimenting, excuse me, experimenting with fashion. Yeah. Um, which I thought was interesting at the time, but they explained it as, oh, it's just because you choose to be more fashionable. And that's what we thought at first because they just associate fashion with uh, sexuality, which is sort of ridiculous. But um, yeah, so it's always been a part of me, but I just don't think I had enough role models to really push the envelope. So I nest, I didn't necessarily like try to dress up more than what I would have wanted to. But then when content came along and getting to dress up for videos where it's a little bit less pressure than going outside and dressing up because then you have physical eyes on you. Whereas online, it's more of this presence you put on there. You're not actually in front of every, anyone. And, um, and you know, you just wear it for however long you film and take it off and it's, it's much easier. But because a lot of people online did it, it made me more comfortable to, to dress the way I wanted to. And since I had a lot of people online who I looked up to who were successful and did dress up, dressing up felt more of a uh, comfortable thing to do. And it allowed me to experiment a lot more and just explore fashion much, much more heavily than I did in the past. But it's always been something I've wanted to do or get into more. Yeah. And nowadays it's, it's extremely influenced by other creators, of course, but especially K-pop fashion, uh, just because there's, those are a lot of my inspiration. So of course you want to dress like your inspirations or, or just in the styles, uh, that the people you look up to like. So then that's how a lot of it tends to develop. I want to get some, some quick fashion hitters from you. How does that sound? Yeah. Um, favorite brands. Oh, favorite brands. Um, okay. So I don't necessarily have favorite brands. Some, okay. So jewelry is my friend's brand, OHT. Um, they actually design a lot for K-pop idols. Uh, the rings I wear from another friend called Shiro Studio and clothing is a little more challenging because I actually prefer to thrift my clothes. Ooh, nice. And it, it breaks for me, I love that because it breaks out of the mold of looking for clothing because of the brand and instead working with what you have. So it actually forces me to experiment a bit more and imagine things I wouldn't expect to normally buy to, to try to work into my wardrobe. Um, yeah, it, it allows a lot of experimentation and I mean, it's cheaper, you know, it's, it's a little bit more eco-friendly to buy secondhand. So that's always been good. But um, yeah, so not exactly any clothing brands I necessarily gravitate towards. But I try to be pretty, try to have a lot of variety with it. And thrifting, of course, helps because you can find unique pieces no one has. I love thrifting. Are you are you, uh, you going to act like in shop? You going to Poshmark or anything like that? Or what's your favorite thrift shop? Recently, I mean, I always love Goodwill. I'm always there at Goodwill. Um, I've been really enjoying Crossroads, especially in the LA oh, area. Nice. Crossroads yeah. has always been pretty reliable. Crossroads in San Francisco is really nice. Yeah, I've been uh, to that one too. Nice. Uh, favorite pair of shoes? Pair of shoes. Okay, dance shoes 
always, 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 and this is a callback to the b-boy days, Puma <laughs> Suede's favorite dance shoe forever. Um, but just to wear, I'm, I'm a big fan of Doc Martens. I really enjoy wearing my Docs. The boots are nice. Oxfords are nice there. Yeah. Nice. Any, um, got any, got any celebrity styles you, you dig in right now? Celebrity styles? I don't necessarily look towards one celebrity. Um, I'll just look towards different idol groups. But just to name some, I actually really enjoy Taeyun, uh V from BTS. He has more of like this grandpa core look, uh, which which I love. And then also, I think Stray Kids and ATs, which are other K-pop idol groups. I love their general fashion because it's a little bit more edgy. They have a lot of influences from streetwear and goth styles, etc. So I really appreciate those. Nice. Well, thanks for those quick hitters. Um, and then before we want to move off from dance and fashion, are there mm-hmm. is there anyone out there that is kind of, you know, especially in the dance community that's killing it right now? Any shout outs you want to want to give? Dance community. I mean, OK, honestly, there's so many people killing it. So I dance on a currently I dance on a team called Pandora's Box. And it's crazy because some of them who I think are really, really amazing dancers are like 19 like so Dude, young wild. and they're yeah. killing the game. Yeah. So to name a couple, like two hitters I really look up to is um, Andre and Daniel. They they usually go by Dondre, but they teach collab classes. They're just insanely good, especially especially for their age. Um, Daniel Moulton has been killing it for a while. I've been learning from her for a while. She's a good friend and she's been thriving. So another another person who i just think taking everything to the next level definitely worth knowing as well um but there's there's so many to name just because i don't know what they feed the kids these days but (laughs) they're so good they're so good have you seen the new b-boys those are they're pretty well too i actually have not been keeping up with the b-boy scene but hey drop a few i'm gonna go look them up later and uh, i'd love to see check out um there's a there's a dance studio called breaking mia um, out out in out in Miami, yeah, those kids are crazy. Really, and, and they're like twenty two, twenty three, but okay, um, just just beyond power too. Like just so much maturity in their dance, right so much style. Oh, I'll, I'll definitely watch them. <laughs> well, we got a little bit of your glimpse on dance and fashion. Um, mm-hmm. I wanted to talk about, I guess, your career before content creator, right? Um, yeah, had some, I think. You know, a lot of people that want to pursue creative endeavors, they're not doing it full time. You know, it's like a it's a side hustle. And um, at, before that, they, you know, they're working full time jobs like like the rest of us. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, did, did you have a full time job before moving content creator full time? Yeah. So graduated. So the whole career story is I graduated with kinesiology, originally planning to be a physical therapist and then grad school. I didn't want to go to because it would just take way too much time. Um, I know they devote like most of their day and pretty much most of their week and study very heavily. And I wanted to still dance. So I didn't see myself balancing a lifestyle of school and dance in that regard. So I needed to find some other path, some other way to uh, make a living. And that's when I looked towards computer programming and web design. You were going to build our website. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So I started studying that heavily. Um, I ended up going more of web design, UI, UX. Worked on that for a year, two years. Um, And on the side, I was working at Comcast while I was studying just to have money to get by. And then finally, I got hired as a web designer. And I worked there for three years. Really enjoyed it. Uh, It was a good job. One of the best company cultures I've had. The only thing was balancing content creation because in the middle of that and a little bit before that, I started getting into content and I fell in love with it. Um, It was something I could make money off of, but it's still growing that, you know, it's, it's pretty scary to move into something in the creative field full time, unless you're sure that you can financially provide for yourself. And that was always the thing that held me back. So I never took the jump um, for three years and I just kept on finding ways to further my career while still working, um, but still trying to grow 
my content and everything. And then it wasn't until actually I went full time. What? Oh, is it the seven? So maybe four months ago, four months ago, I went full time finally. Of this year? Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. So pretty recent. Yeah. yeah. And the reason for that was, so I have a manager now. I'm under agency and I, we have weekly meetings. So we had a meeting one day and he was like, hey, for this next month, or sorry, for the next couple months, you have this sponsorship lined up. You're going to do work for this. You're going to be working on this, da, 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 da. And it just like, I looked at it and I realized one, I was going to be extremely busy. Um, two, and it was going to be enough financial income where I could feel comfortable for the next few months and confident enough that I could figure something else out to keep income coming and everything. So once I realized that, I immediately made the switch. I wrote my resignation resignation letter that night, <laughs> turned it in the <laughs> next morning. Um, Cause I've been thinking about it for a while. I've been wanting it for a while. And once I saw, hey, this is possible and it's not as risky as I made it out to be in my head, I just completely jumped the gun on it. Um, turned it in, had my two weeks and went full time. And since then I've just been really, really enjoying my life and like my career path. Yeah. When you were talking to your manager about it and the day you decided to resign, like, were you, were you crunching numbers at all? Or did you just kind of do it on a whim? Like, how did you know it made sense for you to, <laughs> to go full time? I didn't really crunch number numbers heavily. It was mostly on a whim, but also just knowing how much I need per month to survive and how much I would have over the next few months. Um, how much cushion I would have rather. So I think that culmination allowed me to make that decision. But it was on a whim. Definitely. I didn't like calculate anything. I was just like, that's enough. I think I'll be good. So I just full sent because I, I really did have been wanting to for over a year go full time. I think I was just very scared. So you had a broad idea of how you were doing financially? Like you? Yes, you exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's the um, I think that's the fear for a lot of people, at least, and especially the last interviews I've done for the last few videos was when to pull the trigger. And mm -hmm. so many people, you know, they have their way of doing it. You know, they they will put something on a spreadsheet, right? And then maybe they'll have like right. a like an emergency fund. Um, right. Some people some people go on a whim. <laughs> Sounds yeah. like you were kind of in the middle. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I mean, I I also feel like you know you weren't also just. You know, doing something that didn't make sense. I mean, it sounded like mm -hmm. you, you, you knew what you were getting yourself into. Yeah, yeah. I've definitely, I mean, prior to um, content too, I've always been keen on finances and, and, and like just preparing for your future. So a lot of it wasn't foreign and I, I knew what was necessary and not too risky before making the decision. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, and in fact, let's let's go ahead and talk about your life as a content creator. Um, yeah. So did you? Um, so you moved to LA. Was is that part of it? Like to to be a content creator? Absolutely. Um, moving to LA, one hundred percent is a decision for a career, and I think it was the best decision. I truly believe with being a creator that proximity has a very heavy effect on opportunity and literally being in the proximity of other creators of many brands of many events has provided very, very valuable networking or um, sponsorships, collaborations, everything just by being in LA. Um, and I like 90% of the opportunities I had, I don't think would exist if I still lived in the Bay area. Mm. I truly believe just being in LA has amplified the amount of things I'm able to do and, and the amount of work I'm able to have. So moving to LA was 100% career decision, but also I love living in LA. I think it's very exciting, especially especially in your 20s. Um, I love the Bay, don't get me wrong, I love the Bay. But as an adult in your 20s, I think LA has a certain lifestyle, if you enjoy that lifestyle, that is very fulfilling. And for me, is extremely fulfilling. Well, yeah, especially because you're, you know, you're in entertainment and yes, that's kind of like exactly. the entertainment hub. And, 
you know, I want to dig into the the LA thing a little bit more because that's always been kind of like a like a dream for a lot of people is to move to LA and and be an entertainer. Um, and you totally did that. Let's let's think about the maybe the small creator, right? Um, someone that's maybe about to pop off, maybe like 40, 50 k. Uh, they got a brand sponsorship here here or there, you know. Um, but they're still working a full time job and uh, money's just kind of scarce. Uh, you know, is that, do you recommend them that they move to LA or like, how, how do you think about LA for like a small creator? I would only recommend moving to LA as a small creator if you truly want a career in the entertainment and what you're doing. Um, you have a broad, generally broad idea. I don't think you have to be super specific, but a broad idea on what direction you're going. And thirdly, if you know how to make content sustainable for yourself. Um, and what I mean by that is if you know how to create content and produce content and take the whole process and make it possible for you to do for a year, two years without burning out, because that's everyone's um, downfall really is they, especially with small creators or people who grow really fast, is they take the energy and the motivation from that brief period of growth and think they can sustain that for over a year. And a lot of the times people live off the high of the roller coaster and then when they get to the downs, it destroys them. So learning to pave through ups and downs, if you worked out a system, a process, and understand mentally how to navigate that, then I think it's okay to move and really, really push 100% for a career, even moving to LA as a creator. Um, but until that point, until you feel that, that down, I think you should wait just because that tends to be most people's downfall. A lot of people who started when I did are bigger creators could not sustain it because of how volatile social media can be. And, you know, when you when you think about sustainability, like, like, what, what does that, you know, when you think about your own career, right, as a creator, yeah. like, how, how do you think about sustainability to you? I mean, obviously, that that that, that transition video did really well, mm -hmm. that kind of popped you off. And, um, you know, now you're working with some of the biggest entertainers out here, especially in like K-pop and stuff. But how do you think about sustainability and having a long um, you know, long, long career. Right. So for me, sustainability was about learning to create enough content that I thought was a good amount to keep growing as a creator, but also would not burn me out. Um, for me, that means batching content. So making a lot of videos in one day and then editing and letting that roll out over the course of a week or a couple days, whatever. Um, it's just pacing. I think pacing is the most important thing and, and a very difficult thing to do. A lot of people, and I did this as well, go really, really hard for a short amount of time and then don't realize the amount of strain that can build up on you and then just burn out and don't want to make videos for a long time. And being a content creator isn't about producing as much content at once, it's about being a content creator for a long time. So if sustainability for you and a process for you that works and doesn't make you feel exhausted from creating means making one video a week, then that is what it has to be for you. And it has to be that until you develop uh, a routine that allows you to make two healthily. But up until that point, if you're making, I used to make three videos a day Damn. which was way too much, <laughs> but I toned it down to three to five a week, which it works really well for me. And because I know I can sustain that, it doesn't burn me out nearly as much as it might have in the past or, or more videos would. I'm a big fan of, of batching. I think it's a, mm -hmm. it's a really good tactic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm still even working out the schedule for this podcast, you know, like just thinking right. about how to do a podcast every week. Um, 
but but vi- when you add video in there i mean it's there's so many elements to it there's mm-hmm. the storytelling there's the editing and then there's the you know just you actually acting on camera so yeah um, you know i think a lot of people that when they get burnt out they don't realize all the effort it takes into to making these videos right um going back to la i mean how's la you like in la oh i i love it i'm having a lot of fun here <laughs> What's it like living there? I mean, when you describe to people like uh, when you're living in LA? For me, I do know my situation is different because not a lot of people can have the luxury to do it. But um, I think it's fun because every day is completely different. Maybe there's a brand event one day. Maybe I'm filming. Maybe I'm collaborating with some other creators another day. Or since I also dance, maybe I'm taking dance class or working on a performance. Every day is just so drastically different. I don't know what to expect. But because of that, I think it's very fun. Um, and as long as there's a balance of work and, and fun, it's good. But yeah, it's LA has been a, a blast and definitely living a very, a very uh, which, exciting lifestyle right now. You got a favorite uh, food spot? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Sushi, love sushi. Um, If you ever are in Little Tokyo, Sushi Gen, I will die by that place. It's so good. Sushi Gen? Is that what you said? Yeah, Sushi Gen, yeah. Okay. Me me and my girl love sushi, so we got to keep you up for that. Check that one. Like, great price and quality for that price is amazing. Yeah. And then for a fast spot, uh, if you ever heard of Rice and Nori, they do onigiri, and it's like quick cheap but the salmon yuzu is a1 like <laughs> i will always recommend that so you come from an asian american household all right yeah. i mean how was it like telling your parents that you were gonna you're gonna go content full-time <laughs> can you describe that it was so i the funny story is i went home and i was home for about a week and i had to tell my parents but I kept on putting it off until the last day <laughs> yeah. because I was just so nervous since I know exactly what my parents will think. They're very traditional, um, always wanted me to have a better job or a more stable career, et cetera, et cetera. So they weren't always keen on dancing in the first place. So I already mm-hmm. knew what to expect from them. And then when I told my mom, she definitely wasn't happy. <laughs> she definitely wasn't happy. Um, she thought it was not stable, not a good idea, et cetera, et cetera. And my dad was similar. He didn't directly say it to me. He's a little bit more of stay in the background, let my mom do the talking, but yeah. we'll still have his own thoughts and opinions. And he thinks the same, but I knew this coming into it. So for me, it's not necessarily I need their support. It's that I'll show them. I'm successful and doing well for myself. And honestly, at the end of the day, if you can do that and show your parents that, they are forced to accept it because if they see you're doing fine and you're making money, you know, enough to make yourself happy and even, you know, help them out sometimes, they'll be they'll be perfectly happy. At the end of the day, it's just whether you're stable enough or making enough money or making a living. That's what they really care about. It's just, they only know what they know. And that tends to be more traditional routes. Um, So that's how my parents were. But I think nowadays they are coming around to it. My sister did send me a video of my mom showing all my aunts and uncles like, (laughs) oh, this is Johnny's videos. I was so embarrassed, but I was like, okay, that's cool. Um, Yeah, I talked to my dad. I don't think he understands what I'm doing still, but he just says, if you're doing well, then good to hear. And I'm like, that's, I'll take that's that. That's all as I a need. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how are the, how, how are the family parties now? I mean, are they, are they just talking about it or? <laughs> yeah, it's always an interesting conversation. I think my family have seen me do some cool things so far um, since their kids. So my cousins will always show their parents like, oh, look, Johnny, like did this thing. Um, I think one of the biggest ones was I did a, I did a commercial with Fitbit and I played DDR oh, nice. in it and it was like three seconds that I was in it. But 
it was the fact that my family would see it when they're watching YouTube videos or watching TV and the commercial would play. You know, I think I might have seen this actually. You might have. You might have. But for them, that was the coolest thing because it was it would come on when they wouldn't expect it. It's not like, oh, look, Johnny's doing this. It's, oh, I see Johnny in, on TV right now out of nowhere. So I think that was really, really cool. And they really loved that. You know, going back to that and just expectations, is, is this mm-hmm. life like what you expected creating, you know, content? It, no, just because I didn't know what to expect. It's mostly what I expected, but I think very different just because I've never had the experience of creating my schedule so heavily. I I grew up in a lot of structure. School has so much structure and actually transitioning off of that structure was really, really difficult. Um, Now I've developed a little bit more for myself, but definitely did not expect to have this type of lifestyle. I think it was something I dreamed about, Mm. but living it itself is extremely different than the idea you have of it. So I, I love my lifestyle. I think it's, I'm very blessed to have, be able to live like this and, and appreciative of that. Definitely. Yeah. Did you ever dream of becoming an actor at all? Actor or anything like that? No, acting was not, in my sights. But nowadays, I'm not opposed to it. I would totally love to try acting. It's not a goal. It's not a dream of mine. But if the opportunity presented itself, I'd 100% I'd be down to act. That's awesome. Yeah, because like, I know that a lot of people that are on TikTok, um, you know, they, they kind of treat it like their acting gig. Yeah, right? it's kind of like they're real. And um, a lot of people that do TikTok are, are just really good actors, right? They're entertainers. Yes. Um, and so but we, I guess you come from a dance background first. So it's a, mm-hmm. it's a little different. Yeah. What would you say are like some of the like the biggest challenges for you as a as a content creator? I think the biggest challenge is not knowing how to navigate life as a content creator, the business side of the content creator, the mental um, fortitude you need as a content creator. I think there's nothing that prepares you for it until you're in the deep end. So I think just not knowing what the career entails and how life is as a creator is the hardest part because it hits everyone out of nowhere. No. Yeah, that's, that's true. It's like, you know, you, you go into this thinking it's one thing and then it's another thing completely the, <laughs> the opposite yeah. where if, if you were to do like a traditional career, at least you kind of know the trajectory, but right, like, right. there's so many different ways to become a creator whether that's doing like ASMR videos or (laughs) dance transitions or things like that. I know sometimes it can be tough trying to be genuine, you know, to yourself, right. And genuine to your fans. And like, when you, when you think about that, you know, how do you, how do you stay genuine? Not only to your fans, but to yourself. That is definitely challenging, but I think the best way is just to experiment until you find where it overlaps between what you enjoy creating and what works. The hard thing with content is a lot of the times you'll find what you like to do isn't necessarily what works and will make people like your content. And a lot of the times you have to experiment or adjust um, into something that finally works for your audience, but maybe you don't enjoy it. And I think a lot of people will get caught up in, oh, but this works, so I should do that, which yes, is true to an extent, but if you don't enjoy it and you don't enjoy making that type of content, then it's only going to shoot, you're only shooting yourself in the leg. So finding that, that cross is really important and you really just have to experiment. I mean, you could take anything and make it into content. It's just the execution. And finding your own way of execution is is crucial to making it as a creator. Um, and there's there's lots of ways to do it. I think content you can treat or yeah, content you can cr- treat a lot like art in that you can steal from others, but you have to flip it to make it your own. You know, there's I know there's a book. What is it? Um, Steal like an artist. Something yeah, like I that. forgot the name of the author, but I, I know what you're talking about. Yes, yeah. 
but that that one essentially is that you take someone else's idea flip it to make it unique or add another layer and that changes it and then make that your own and i think that's always always a good idea because why wouldn't you want to use a formula that works but obviously we don't just want to be taking other people's stuff so you need to change it to make it your own but if you can elevate it in a way that you like because i'm sure it's easy to find types of content you like then that usually will work best for you have you ever seen someone just copycat your your stuff like oh all the time oh yeah all the time. <laughs> how, do you, how do you feel about that i mean i guess it's kind of flattering right it is flattering i don't mind um i think the mindset i keep with that is i can do it better so <laughs> it doesn't matter <laughs> <laughs> that's a positive way of uh, seeing, looking at it <laughs> yeah yeah oh i love that um are there any misconceptions about this lifestyle Absolutely. I think I think there's a lot of connotation on the word influencer. Yeah. It's the reason uh, why I didn't I've, say it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. I've grown to just accept it, you know. I will call myself an influencer. I prefer a content creator, but I just it's fine. I don't I don't mind it anymore. Um I think I've gotten past the worry of the connotation of the word a little bit more. But I think there are a lot of misconceptions. I think there's a lot of um, assumptions about people in this industry, many which are correct. I think it's a very mixed bag with the type of creators and influencers, et cetera, that exist. I've definitely met a lot of the bad apples who I will avoid like the plague. And then I've also met a lot of the people who I genuinely enjoy and value and would support 100%. So I think it's just that the bad apples will make a bigger impact, a public, bigger public impact that gives more people a idea of content creators. Whereas the good ones, you know, you don't normally see in the news, good deeds happening, you see bad deeds happening. So it just comes off to the public that way. There's a lot of assumptions about that. But even in the past when I've met people or met other creators and they have any misconstrued assumptions, even about me, uh, typically when you meet people, you'll see whether those are right or wrong and you'll get an idea of their character. So I've often had people think otherwise of me, like even in dance, even in dance, I have one of my really yeah. good dance friends who when he first met me was like, oh, who's this guy who like is trying to look like a K-pop idol and like <laughs> thinks he's the shit cause he's all this and that. And then he met me and he's like, I like you, you're a homie. So a lot of times meeting people will change it, but there's definitely a lot of assumptions. It's very easy to make assumptions, especially only knowing an online persona. It'll always happen. I think it's just something you got to accept. It's kind of something that you signed up for, huh? Yep. And how do you, uh, I mean, Speaking of that, like, how do you deal with like the mean people? Does it bother you at all, or you don't think about it, or because you know, for a lot of people, especially creators that are starting out, I mean, they they see the negativity and it's yeah, it's kind of hard to ignore. I've been a little lucky, and I don't really see any hate comments. Um, I don't think I get too many, and I think I'm lucky because I probably reached my target audience of people who would enjoy my content pretty quickly. Um, so I don't actually deal with a lot of that at all. The most I've dealt with is other creators who might have a bad impression on me, um, who will think otherwise, and then maybe say something to other people. But again, once those other people have met me, they realize that a lot of those assumptions are unfound and then realize like, oh, I actually really enjoy Johnny as a person. So that's been fine. But online, I actually haven't experienced that that much like not nearly as much as other people which i'm very very lucky in that regard but i think a part of that too is that i don't dig into my comments i actually prefer not to look at them too much just yeah. because i know it can get to your head or affect you mentally so i actually sort of avoid it a little bit uh not too much but 
I don't know if that's healthy either, the avoidance, but <laughs> it works and it's kept me peace of mind. You know, ignorance is bliss. It's a black hole when you look at those comments, I feel like. Yes. Yeah. How do you think about mental health as a creator? Because there's there's two sides of the coin, right? There's there's one side where, you know, you get this huge dopamine hit, like you said, millions of views. Um, you get to interact with this vibrant community and you get feedback right away and which you know helps you improve your videos but on the other side of the coin it's like um, you get all this negativity and then you also get like all this stuff that's just that's just innately with social media that makes you feel really bad about it right and so yeah how do, you, how do you think about mental health and in, in this career uh what's crazy about mental health as creators is i have met and know i think a majority of creators unfortunately have a level of depression or just mental health purely because of the lifestyle or not necessarily lifestyle, but what success means as a creator. And unfortunately it's very heavily based in numbers and metrics, which we place value into metrics and that can destroy you because there's so many factors that go into the success of your content. Sometimes it's purely luck hitting, showing the right people. Uh, maybe the algorithm wasn't working in your favor be and but the content was good still and a lot of people place value too much value in that um and it goes back to when i talked about sustainability as a creator being able to create for a year versus going really heavy for a few months i think for me that was a huge switch because i definitely have dealt with my own uh downs of putting too much value into my metrics oh my video didn't do as well and they haven't been doing as well for a while. Like I'm failing as a content creator. That would literally go through my mind and that would make me tank. That would make me feel burnt out. That would make me feel like I don't want to create content. And that's, it's been, that's happened multiple, multiple times. But I think this year is when I started to shift my mindset towards, okay, regardless of numbers, how do I continue to create content for a year or more than a year? And thinking a little bit more long term, I think that's what matters. Because I've, since I've been done content for so long, I've learned and saw firsthand it is a roller coaster. Sometimes you just have your your periods where you're very successful, like things are great, your numbers are great, etc. And we sort of live for those, and it, you, you, could, you sort of can't help it. But you also have those downs, and it's understanding content naturally. Your success naturally will take those roller coaster ups and downs it's not always going to be up it's not always going to be down and you sort of have to think about it as phases sometimes i think of it as when my content does really well i'm in a growth phase when my content goes down i'm in an experimental phase um, so i think it's shifting your mindset from the immediate feedback of numbers and shifting it towards how do i last a long time as a creator because Again, many creators have started when I started and burnt out because they just felt like, oh, their content didn't do as well. And I think there's a saying that goes with it. Um, I forget exactly what it is, but basically it's the idea of stopping right before you hit success, like that one step. I forget the exact quote, but I think you get the gist of it. Yeah. And I think that's so true with content. A lot of the times I have it where I debate on one video, oh, it's not good enough. I post it and that happens to be the one that goes viral or something like that. And I was so always close happens. To that. <laughs> Sorry? Always happens. The yes. one that you ex least expect. Yes, yeah. always the one you least expect. And it happens a lot where most of it is a mental battle. Um, so I definitely think sustainability is very key for people to battle with mental health. And another part of that too is, um, and I, I think I started doing this a little bit more, but for a long while, at least half a year, I was definitely felt like I was in a rut with content and I, I was pretty sad about it. I didn't feel like I was succeeding. I felt like, oh, I was so much more successful last year. Like what's happening this year? You know, am I, am I not a good creator? And then it just burnt me out and the rest of my life started to feel stressed and not as enjoyable stemming from that. And after a while, I thought about it a lot and I was trying to see, okay, how do I re-inspire myself, re-motivate myself? 
And I think I made a decision to work on the rest of my life. Mm. And ironically, that worked really well with making me want to do content even more and feeling inspired, inspired and feeling good about it was getting the rest of my life right. So eating, exercise, or just doing a lot of passions I enjoy. For me, that was dance. Once I put a lot of time and energy into those things, it helped me actually want to do content because I felt fulfilled as a person. And being fulfilled as a person uh, allowed me to be more creative again. And then that fueled my content. So that was a really, really big thing for me because I felt so overwhelmed from the ideas of success or making enough or doing well enough as a creator. And yeah, I, I watched actually, if you ever heard of, I think it's healthy gamer GG. No, like but I'll, I'll put that down. Is, is he, yeah, is he, what, is, what is he? He's like a, I think he's a doctor, right? But he makes YouTube videos specifically catered towards streamers, just talking about mental health and, and overcoming things. I think there's this one video where he talked about the feeling of being overwhelmed and how to overcome that. And it was really interesting because he said you feel overwhelmed when the amount of passive stresses in your life are greater than the active stresses in your life. And passive mm -hmm. stresses are things you can't control. So the financial stress, right? Like when is my next job going to come in, et cetera? Um, or like, no, like things, basically, essentially things you can't control, like how well your content does. Um, when that becomes your focus, you feel like your life is out of control because you don't have any any ability to directly change those. Like there are things that can change it, but it's not completely in your power. But if you pick more active stressors in your life that you actually can control and you have a bit more of those, it makes you feel in more, more in control. So choosing to have active stressors. So for me, that was choosing to dance more. I pick to dance. That is taking away my time from everything else, but I'm in control of that. And mentally that made me feel like, oh, I have power over my life again. And I felt less overwhelmed. It's a little bit interesting because it's sort of backwards in how you think. Um, yeah. And I'm sure his video explains it much better than me, but that actually did help me feel less overwhelmed by picking things that I can control and I choose to do rather than getting rid of those things. Because when I was stressed with everything else, I chose to do less outside activities and it actually made it worse. So at least in my case, that worked really well is uh, in overcoming the feeling of being overwhelmed. And that thus helped my burnout. Do, do you know who Zeshin is, B-Boy Zeshin? Yes, yes. I, I was a big fan of him. <laughs> he, uh, he, I mean, it's, it's what you, you said reminded me of what he said in an interview as well, which was like, Cause he's a doctor too and he's mm. also a b-boy and um you know when when do when the doctor stuff gets really stressful then he goes breaks right and right. then if the breaking stuff gets really stressful then you know he goes back to doctor and you know just finding ways to i like what you said about passive versus active stress right like active being the ones that you can control yeah and um you know if if there's some things out of your control go to do the things that you can control <laughs> mm -hmm. um and I also like the thing you said about growth versus experimental. I think that mindset shift can help a lot of people instead of thinking yeah. about it emotionally. It's like, okay, the music or the video didn't do so well. That's, that's just me being experimental instead of putting yeah. like a negative emotion to it. Right, right. I wanted to talk about being a millennial since this is the mm. millennial method yes. podcast. Um, late, you're late, late 20s now, 29? 28? 20, oh, 27. <laughs> 27, man, you are you are so good right now. How does it feel? Oh, thanks. It like? Honestly, it's not bad. I like being my age for the most part. I think the only time I feel my age is when the majority of the people I'm around, especially creators, are around 19, 18, <laughs> 20. Yeah. That's when it really sinks in like, oh, man, I... I am old, even though I'm not, right? There's still plenty of life ahead of me, but that just meeting so many young people and having so many young people in the space definitely, definitely um, makes me feel that way. But I think the age and experience I've had just from living out more of my adulthood has definitely helped with my mindset and um, approach to content and even to people and, and living a life as a creator but 
that I enjoy. Do you see more younger creators or older creators in your network? Definitely younger, but I have made friends with quite a few older creators, older than me even. So that's definitely given me comfort to know I'm at least somewhere in the middle, but dominantly much younger. Yeah, that puts into perspective. Um, it's crazy too, because it's like when for TikTok first came out, it was, I mean, it was a young platform. It was like a lot of um, teenagers, you know, making yeah. videos, and I'm seeing creators all across the spectrum, which is really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just even seniors, right? Like, <laughs> right. Like it's it's really cool. Um, do you see yourself being a creator for the long term? Long term. Not in the long term. And I think this goes for most creators. I see myself as a creator at least for the next couple of years. But after that, I'm not quite so sure. I think it's just unless you can reinvent yourself or go onto a new platform, I think that helps keep it fresh. But I've found actually, and I think there's a st- statistic for it for YouTubers, actually. Um, the general lifespan of a YouTuber is about seven years. And they've talked about this a lot. And that's when you start to feel very, very burnt out or most like uh, number wise, that's when most YouTube creators tend to stop. That's the average. And I think it's just living life as a creator for so long. Um, It's sort of a natural tendency to move towards something else like building a business or or creating something that helps other creators, et cetera, et cetera. So I for the next few years, yes, but I would love to later on down the line, uh, move towards something else. I think also with, and that goes towards with being life, the lifestyle of a creator because everything is very adaptable. I did not expect myself to have this career. And in the future, I 100% acknowledge I could probably be doing something completely different, but I think that's what makes it more fun is having the luxury to try different paths or, or experiment and, and just get to do so many different things. I think that goes with the industry and being a creator. So naturally that follows how I feel. And yeah, definitely five years. I don't think I'll be a creator. I'll be doing something else. Do you have any idea what that looks like? You know, I've, I've talked a lot with my manager about modeling. Um, Okay. Yeah. I do want to start my own business. I don't know whether that's consulting or clothing or something else, but definitely want to start my, uh, some sort of business as well. Yeah, and I think like um, you know, if you were to compare it to like a, a normal job, right? You get four or five years of experience in the industry. I mean, right. at that point, you have you have enough experience to build your own business and whatever that might be, right? Maybe it's yeah. consulting for creators. Maybe it's becoming like a coach. Would you ever want to do a normal job again? Um, normal? No. In quotes. No. <laughs> at most, I've thought about this a lot. I want to do side quests, so I'd love to work at a coffee shop as a barista part-time. So you kind of answered the, you know, the kind of the two to three years out. So let's say, let's fast forward, like you're 30 years old now. Okay. Um, I mean, obviously that's a long time, but what can you imagine your thirties are like? Thirties. I feel like back then, to be honest, I do like doing stuff in front of the camera. Maybe not as a uh, creator, but it could be, I've seen a lot of my friends start to do their own podcasts or host shows, MC, stuff like that. So if it was something along that realm, I'd actually be very excited to do that. Like, I think MCing an event or hosting an event or interviewing um, for idols, for example, would be super, super fun. And that's something I would love to do. And I think I like public speaking. I did a public speaking, like a, a whole keynote last year. I found that I really enjoyed that. So that yeah. could be something I would want to lean into in the future. I, I didn't know you were into public speaking. Were you, were you always into it? Oh, even absolutely. Like really, I, even before? No, I, I hated public speaking. Like, That's what I remember. <laughs> the bane of my existence back in college. Public speaking class? Oh, gosh, no. Um, I when think did that Was it being a creator? It was, so I think streaming on Twitch helped me feel comfortable with talking and talking in front of an audience, but it's also behind a screen. So there's no one directly watching you. Um, 
But when I did the, so last year for VidCon, I did a creator keynote and mm. in front of an audience, I had five minutes to talk about whatever you want. And it was the most stressful experience, probably one of the most stressful experiences I've had preparing for that. But after I did it, I found it to be one of the most gratifying things. Um, and I, I think it was just the idea, since I am a performer as a dancer, the idea of getting on stage and getting to present something was was really fun for me. And then also being able to deliver a message or a story or some takeaway for the audience. I think I love being able to educate or inspire. So being given a platform to talk about something I'd love or want to share with the world uh, made all the difference for enjoying public speaking. Because college, it was, it was like, <laughs> I was just trying to get by, man. I think yeah. I gave a speech on, I don't know, something really ridiculous, like that I didn't care about. So I think that was why I didn't like it. But getting an opportunity to do something and share about something I love completely switched it for me. So that's why I actually enjoy public speaking now. Are you introverted or extroverted? I used to be introverted. Now I'm extroverted. So are you uh, like introverted extrovert or just extrovert extrovert? I think I'm 60% extrovert on the scale, yeah. What do you think your 20s should be? Because, I mean, there's still some millennials out there that are, you know, the 25, but when you think about your 20s, like, what, what do you think your 20s should be about? So when I think about my 20s and what I would tell other people, I really think about all the things I didn't do and I wish I did. Because um, in hindsight, I don't think you realize the luxury of how much time and the opportunities that you can take, especially being younger. So 100%, I would have taken and made way riskier decisions. Um, I would have gone to do more things, even though I was scared. I think the 20s is just a time of experimentation and trying things. You aren't held down by as many responsibilities. You're given the luxury to have a lot of time without feeling like you need to be responsible. So definitely it's just experiment more, like feel free to mess up, make mistakes. I think I was too scared to make a mistake, which is what held me back from a lot of decisions and a lot of opportunities. But um, yeah, put yourself out of your comfort zone, making mistakes. I think that's what your 20s should be about is just living life as full as you can because you really don't realize how valuable that time is until later on when you realize you become a lot more pressed for time because of responsibilities, because of your job, your career, everything getting too serious or, or something like that. That's been kind of the common theme with all the people that I've interviewed so far is, is just experimentation, right? Even if you're like 25, even if you're 35, I feel like you always have room to reinvent yourself and you know, I, I feel like you reinvented yourself a couple times before, <laughs> you know, you kind of saw where you are now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, John, I think this has been super awesome, brother. So glad we got to catch up. Um, you know, is there anything that you want to close with? You know, my audience has been mostly just millennials that many of them work a full-time job. I've thought about mm -hmm. um, going content full-time, but anything you want to say to them? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm 27, which is old or young, however you look at it. But I think what helps me is even though I'm getting older and I'm 27 and I'm getting close to my 30s and I feel like I'm held down by a lot of responsibility, it's really up to you whether you believe that you can, whether you believe you're still young or you can take risks, you can always take a risk. Um, Yes, some are a little scarier than others, but I don't think you should let your age hold you down and being older hold you down from choosing to live a life that you know you'll enjoy more. Because I think going into content, I was scared because I was quite a bit older than most, most of the other people doing content creation. But at the end of the day, I was also getting older and realizing if I don't do this now, I probably can't do it later. And looking back, I think based on my previous experiences, I have 
enjoyed life much more when I did the things I wanted to, rather than picking a, a safer route that I don't think I'd enjoy. So don't let your age hold you back from still choosing to do the things you love that you're passionate about or making a career change into something you would enjoy more because it's just it's just way more gratifying. And I really think if you are willing to put in the work, things will work out. It's more of a time thing rather than a, is it possible? It's just, do you have the patience to allow yourself to be successful rather than will you be successful? Yeah, it's good to see you're doing well. Um, let me know when you're in the Bay. I mean, yeah. when's the last time you were here? Oh, man. What was it? March? But I'll be back next month. Ooh. Okay, we'll, we'll get the gang together, you know, we'll get David and uh, yeah. um, I know you, David and you, David and Dorothy have a thing sometimes. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah we'll always hang out. I mean, we ran into each other last time. Head in the clouds, right? Weren't you guys uh, there together? Oh, I did see David. He was uh, taking photos at Head in the Clouds. So we like messaged each other to meet up and got a picture and talked for a, really, a little bit. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, let me know if you're in town um, and then I'll let you know when I'm in town so we can get like Sushi Gen or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll take you out, dude. All right, brother, take it easy. All right, thank you. Hey, thanks for checking out the podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel as well as wherever you get your podcasts. Apple, Spotify, we're all there. Happy living and I will see you at the next one.